Hey y'all, welcome to episode 4 of Science and Engineering in KSP. I'm your host, Andy Leonard, and today we're going to be looking at radius, velocity, and the specific mechanical energy associated with an orbit, and we're going to be seeing how these three things fit together to form the vis viva equation. Now, what's the point? Why are we going to learn about this vis viva equation? Well, it turns out it's going to be a very, very useful equation going forward when we cover more advanced topics like planning maneuvers, changing orbits, and even getting to other celestial bodies, because we certainly don't want to stay stuck in orbit about Kerbin forever. Um, so let's start out today by reviewing some of the ellipse geometry we've learned and talking about the radius. So we didn't explicitly state this equation in episode one, but if you go back and look at our equations for the apoapse radius and the periapse radius, you can show that this is true algebraically. So what does this say? This says that radius is the semi-major axis times one minus the eccentricity all over one plus cosine of the true anomaly. And this makes sense because from what we know about ellipses, we would expect that our radius can be defined as some function of our true anomaly, so our angular distance from the periapse, we would expect that we can characterize the radius in that way. Um, if, we, if we take it a little bit further, and if we think about Newton's second law, uh, remember that says that we sweep out equal areas and equal times in, uh, in flight, we, we would also realize that velocity and radius must also somehow be related because your uh, your time of flight is going to be governed by your velocity and the area you sweep out is going to be partially governed by your radius. It's going to be some function of your radius, right? So there has to be a, a way to relate radius and velocity. And so to, to talk about how they're related, we need to talk about angular momentum of an orbit. Now angular momentum is in the context of orbits radius times velocity times the cosine of phi which is the flight path angle and we'll switch over and uh, talk about what the flight path angle is in a second but first let's uh, note that this is the specific angular momentum so there's no mass that word specific means just the momentum per unit mass. And anytime we talk about specific, we're, we're talking about it per unit mass. So we divide through by mass and we remove it from the equation. Uh, also, I want to point out that um, apart from just this relatively simple formula we have here, we could also define this in terms of vectors and do all kinds of crazy kinky things like cross products. But um, I'll leave that to you to go out and, and search for yourself. I just want to keep this as accessible as possible. So let's switch over and talk a little bit more about the flight path angle. Now the flight path angle is just the angle between the local horizontal and the direction of our velocity. So basically the direction that we're traveling in. You see here we have a flight path angle of like, what? I don't know. 27, 28 degrees, and so this angle that I'm sweeping out here, let's see, I'm pitching, so this angle that I'm sweeping out here is our flight path angle, and if we switch over to map view, we can get another look at what's going on here. So if we zoom in and we imagine a line that's tangent to the surface of Kerbin, this line here, that would be our local horizontal, and our velocity vector is going that way, right? Now the flight path angle will change with your orbit, particularly, particularly with higher eccentricities, and so let's zoom, uh, zoom around a little bit and speed up time and see how it changes. And it looks like as we approach apoapse, our flight path angle was zero there for a second, and when we come around to periapse, our flight path angle is also zero. So that tells us that we can find a relationship between R and V because cosine of a zero angle is just one. So if we look, we can relate 
our radius and velocity at apoapse and periapse, and they're the same thing, and they're just going to give us our angular momentum. So let's double check this real quick. We have our speed at apoapse, and we multiply that by our apoapse height plus the radius, those 600 kilometers, and we get 1,949,000,000 meters squared per second. Okay, so let's take our speed at periapse, multiply it by the periapse height plus the 600 kilometers, and we get 1,949,000,000 meters squared per second. So that checks out, and that's good. Um, but we should look for another way to characterize our radius and velocity, or to relate our radius and velocity, because we're not always going to be able to figure out the angular momentum, okay? So how do we do that? By using this equation for the specific mechanical energy associated with an orbit, um, which just tells you that your specific mechanical energy is equal to your velocity squared over 2 plus the negative of your gravitational parameter over r. And uh, let's dive into this a little bit deeper and see if we can figure out whether it makes sense if you've ever taken a physics class where you've had to talk about the energy of an object in motion at a certain height, then you might remember this equation for energy, which tells you that the energy in any case is equal to uh, 1 half mv squared minus mgz. Or you might have seen plus gz, but the g would have been negative because gravity points down. Um, where z is your height and g is the gravitational acceleration on Earth at sea level. And so basically we have names for these. We call this the kinetic energy and we call this the potential energy. Again, the, the energy you have because you're moving and the energy you have because gravity is acting on you. Um, now if we scroll back up to the specific energy, the, the specific makes sense. You can see we've gotten rid of little m. Um, and the kinetic energy should make sense. It's not, you know, too far of a leap from v squared over 2 to v squared over 2. But what about the potential energy? So how do we go from gz to negative mu over r? Well, if we use Newton's second law, f equals ma, uh, we know that ma in the context of gravity is equal to g big M little m over r squared. So that's the universal gravitational constant, the mass of the attracting body, your mass, over the radius squared. And since we're uh, specific, we can get rid of the m, so we just have g m over r squared. And when we multiply in the z, we can get rid of the squared here in the denominator. So that goes away and that goes away because in this in the context of an orbit our height is just our radius our distance from the center so hopefully that makes sense that we would end up with mu over r and just like your specific angular momentum your specific mechanical energy is constant for an orbit so assuming you don't change anything you're gonna have the same uh, mechanical energy and we have yet another way that we can relate our radius and our velocity. But what would we do if we uh, wanted to just have the radius and the velocity, if we didn't want to go to the trouble of calculating our mechanical energy? Well, let's use the specific angular momentum to help us figure this out. And let's uh, say we're going to talk about the periapse distance, for example. All right, and then we have the specific energy is equal to the angular momentum squared over 2 times the periapse radius squared plus mu over the uh, periapse radius. And then when we expand this out a little bit further by substituting in things we know, we get this kind of gnarly looking equation and then we can simplify it further to mu over 2a. And what this means is that the velocity squared over 2 minus mu over r is equal to mu over 2a. So we've basically figured out a way to relate 
our velocity and our radius directly given we know our semi-major axis which we can calculate and this is a very very powerful and very important equation called the vis viva equation and there's a lot of different forms of it we rearrange it a lot to get different things uh, in different places and solve for for different quantities that we need like the velocity or the radius or whatever and so we can we can do a lot with this equation so let's start off with a really basic example just so we can convince ourselves that the vis viva equation does apply in game uh, we're in a low circular orbit here and if we remember back to the geometry of ellipses we know that for circular orbits your radius is equal to your semi-major axis so when we pull up the vis viva equation and we rearrange it a little bit we get the uh, circular satellite speed is going to be equal to the square root of the gravitational parameter divided by your radius and when we do that we get 2246.14 meters per second so pretty darn close and the only reason we're off a little bit is because of these extra few meters here so what if we wanted to do something more useful than just verify the uh, the readouts we get in game well remember back to last week we did the Hohmann transfer in order to get from a lower orbit to a higher orbit what if we could do that without having to set a maneuver node what if we could just manually do it figure out uh, how fast we needed to be going and, and change things that way. Well, we can. All we need to do is rearrange the vis viva equation. So if I want to get into a, uh, an orbit with a 600 kilometer apoap circular orbit, um, I'd break that up into a couple of different parts. First, we'd talk about the, uh, the first transfer orbit. So the orbit that with a 100 kilometer periapse and 600 kilometer apoapse and we'd find out that the semi-major axis is about 950 kilometers and then we'd uh, plug that into the vis viva equation and we'd find that our velocity at periapse would be uh, 2524 meters per second if we were in a situation like that with our you know apoapse way out there so what does that mean since we're going 2245 meters per second we need to increase our velocity or we need to gain a delta v of 278 meters per second hopefully that makes sense we're going to try and burn and uh, eyeball it here so we are pointing oh we don't want to point point retrograde we want to point prograde and we are going to fire and get to velocity of 2524 alright we got to 2528 we overshot it slightly and we found our apoapse is 614 kilometers that's not too too bad but let's clean that up a little bit all right that's much much better so now what we do is we need to figure out how much we need to burn once we're out here and in order to do that we need to figure out our velocity there so our velocity at apoapse using the same equation just uh, with a different radius our velocity at apoapse is going to be 1472 meters per second um, so once we once we know that we take uh, we rearrange the equation or rewrite the equation for a 600 kilometer circular orbit we find our semi-major axis is 1 million 200 thousand meters and then we find that if we want a 600 kilometer circular orbit when we're out here we need to get a velocity of 1715.52 meters per second so basically we need a delta V of 242.93 meters per second it's getting bigger yep and you can see so when you see the apoapse and periapse markers flip around like that that's kind of the the hint that you're circularizing your orbit and uh, we 
we got pretty close with our calculated value. We've got uh, a velocity now of 1,712 versus 1,715. So that's, that's pretty close. Um, so using these equations, you don't have to set maneuver nodes. You know, if you just wanna, if you wanna have fun and do some math, you can, you can do that in the game, and the game lets you do that. Finally, um, what would we do? How would we solve it if we wanted to open up our orbit? And by that I mean just like escape Kerbin. Up till now, we've only ever talked about circular and elliptical orbits. So how do we how do we do those kind of cool escape trajectories and flyby trajectories and stuff like that that you may have seen before? Well, in that case, since we open up in a parabola, our semi-major axis is basically infinite because the those points never meet again. And so when we plug that into our vis viva equation, we can basically ignore the semi-major axis term and using mu times two over uh, 1200 kilometers square root, we find that our velocity will have to be uh, 2426 meters per second if we want to escape. So we need a delta V of 714 meters per second. So we're pointed prograde and let's just, let's get out of here. Yep, and you see that we escaped there at 2411 meters per second, and that number was a little bit lower because we were a little bit higher up than uh, 600 kilometers. We were 605 kilometers up, so that, that that's why there's a little, you know, you're slightly off in the math, just because I haven't been exactly putting in my heights and stuff. If I wanted to do it exactly, I would do that. But yeah, we're escaping there, and... Uh, Jebediah is going to go for a little trip. A long trip. Never coming back. <laughs> well, I think that about does it for this week. Um, thank you for watching. Hope you had fun watching. I had fun making it. Uh, next week, we're going to be talking about the rocket equation, uh, which is going to be pretty exciting. We've only ever really talked about orbital mechanics and stuff like that, so next week we're going to get into... Uh, how you you build things and how you design things to be uh, what you need them to be um, Thanks again for watching. I'll see you next week And I almost forgot uh, last week. I made a promise to user Geolu Henge on the Kerbal Academy subreddit So uh, I guess I better fulfill it Hey Geolu Henge, this is George Takei. Thank you for watching science and engineering in KSB Oh my... <laughs>